very good evening. His Excellency, Mr. Arun Kumar Sahu, High Commissioner of India, Independent Senator Dr. Varma Dial Singh, Swami Brahmade, Dr. Chabinath Hari Ramnarain, Dr. Prithiviraj Bahadur Singh, Dr. Himlata Sanghi, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sasha Jagasa, and I will be hosting this evening's program. It is my pleasure to welcome you this evening as we celebrate our sixth Ayurveda day on the theme Ayurveda for Poshan. Ayurveda, also called Ayurvedic medicine, is a traditional system of Indian medicine. It is one of the world's oldest holistic healing systems, having been developed more than 3,000 years ago in India. Ayurveda is based on the belief that health and wellness depend on a delicate balance between the mind, body, and spirit with its main goal of promoting good health. Today's program will feature key speakers and presentations on the benefits and usefulness of Ayurvedic practices. As we begin, we will now play a video related to the journey of Ayurveda, followed by another from the Ministry of Ayush Government of India. Pashem Sharada Shatam Jeevem Sharada Shatam Buddhem Sharada Shatam Rohem Sharada Shatam Pushem Sharada Shatam Bhavem Sharada Shatam Ayurveda Amrudanam. This is the rhyme from Veda, which means that Ayurveda is nothing but for longevity. And Charaga says Ayurveda has no starting, no ending. It is Sanadhan and Anadi, which means the knowledge of Ayurveda has been remaining in the universe all the time to come. In that way, the Ayurveda came into literary existence through some hithas like Charaga, Susruda and Vagpada some 3000 years back. In fact, these two schools of thought led to the writing of two major books on Ayurveda, Charaka Samhita and Sushruta Samhita. Most of the modern illnesses, because modern medicine has eliminated many of the infectious diseases, the overall you know, living conditions have improved. But these diseases, what we call as the lifestyle disorders, are really going to be the problem of the future. All of a sudden we wake up in the morning and we discover that something is wrong. We go to doctor and we notice that after checking blood our blood sugar is high. And we are labeled as diabetes. But this doesn't happen overnight. It is a sequential process. Modern science or modern medicine we have no clue how it happens in a sequential manner. First the imbalance happens say in one dosha. Okay. The, then this, this dosha will accumulate. That's stage one. After that, it sort of gets into a state of agitation. That's stage two. Stage three is that it spreads into the body. Stage four, it goes into a vulnerable area. Up to this point, Ayurveda can actually reverse everything. Because stage five is the manifestation of disease. Stage six is the manifestation of complications. All these diseases are originated because of the body's imbalance. The Ayurveda says how it can correct the body's imbalances by two methods. One is the pacification method, Shamana Chigilsa. Second one is the purification method. The purificatory method is Shodhana Chigilsa, the famous Pancha Karma, which we do in almost all good authentic Ayurveda hospitals. In Ayurvedic medicine, the practice of Pancha Karma is a therapeutic way of eliminating toxic elements from the body. During the massage with warm handmade herbal oils, the body is detoxified through the skin. In Ayurveda, this oil treatment is called Snehana. The use of Swedana will result in the patient breaking out in a sweat. A successful Panchakarma treatment helps eliminate the accumulated toxins in the body. 
and yoga brings man to the natural state of tranquility, which is equilibrium. Contemporary Ayurveda consists of proprietary Ayurvedic formulations that are validated by modern science. In early 30s, there was no medicine that brought down blood pressure. There was no antihypertensive medicine. The only way to bring down blood pressure was to drain blood. So the first antihypertensive product given to the world was given by the founder of Himalaya Drug Company. It was made from the root of a plant called Rovulfia serpentina. Subsequently, Siba extracted the active principle or the chemical that was responsible for bringing down blood pressure. And that chemical was called Rezepine. Now, Ayurveda obviously had, because herbal medicine we know has, has great value and a lot of the modern medicine comes out of herbal medicine. If we take Ayurveda the way it has been known or the, all the herbal medicines and there are people in government institutions and privately who have actually done the pharmacopoeia on herbal medicine, that we apply modern scientific techniques to, mod, to herbal medicine and try to make an amalgam between the two not only as complementary but as a fusion that I think that there is room to fuse modern medicine and herbal medicine to achieve two things one that your therapies will be equally good or more or more effective two they will be imminently more human friendly so that you don't have to cut out the body or you don't have to use x-ray and all that and third it would be half the price As we progress through the 21st century, it can truly be said that Ayurvedic medicine has gone global, gaining international interest and respect as an alternative means of caring for physical and mental health. I see why our medical doctors are coming to our training. They're coming because they have lost their Dharma, as you say. You know, they once studied medicine because they wanted to do something for humanity. Then they ended up in a technical medicine. Now they're coming to our trainings in Ayurvedic medicine because they're finding back their, you know, back to their own profession and they're finding back to their own mission in life they want to share. Today, one of the world's most ancient and continuously practiced medical systems is seeking its place in the modern world. What we see today uh, in Western countries and also globally is a trend towards um, integration, towards integrative medicine. And um, for our understanding um, in the universitarian setup, that does not mean, um, you know, a sort of random integration of therapeutic elements, but it means the integration um, of uh, the best possible therapeutic tools for our individual patients out of the mixture of different therapeutic modes. Suppose we have a patient who comes in with rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis of the knee, so joint and bone disorders, and um, asks us for help or for our uh, medical advice. This patient will of course also receive Ayurvedic treatment. I'm a gynecologist and obstetrician, so I try to find holistic concepts for the treatment in gynecology and um, obstetrics. We deal with a pregnant women like with patients, and th this is wrong. But we can help them to um, have a good pregnancy, to have a good time using also these techniques of uh, natural herbs, of um, meditation, of yoga during pregnancies. Also, we start to teach the mothers uh, to apply Ayurvedic massage uh, to their newborn babies every day. This moment they start with the massage, the babies are very quiet, very relaxed and this is, a, I think, a very important and uh, pleasant atmosphere. 
Ayurveda being a holistic form of medicine, it bears close resemblance to European medical traditions. Europeans therefore have found a growing acceptance of this ancient medical system. Ayurveda is the science of 21st century. Ayurveda is actually futuristic medicine. Ayurveda is not a medicine of past at all. In my opinion, everything starts from the mind in any case, you know. So uh, we, 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 we cannot ignore it and I would say 20% of diseases should be treated by modern medicine. And the remaining by Ayurveda and all the 100 other systems that also exist. The allopathic medicine and this ancient medicine combined, combined it, I think can be immense benefit to humanity. A very informative piece on Ayurveda and its continued relevance in modern day medicine. Uh, as we continue today's program, I would now like to invite His Excellency, Mr. Arun Kumar Sahu, High Commissioner of India, to Trinidad and Tobago to give his remarks. Swami uh, Brahma Devoji of the Brahma Vidya Pitam, Senator Dr. Burma Dayal Singh, Dr. Chabidas Hari Ram Narayan, Dr. Prithraj Bahadur Singh, Sister Hemlata, guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Today's event is the third event in the last year and a half where I am talking about the Indian system of medicine or Ayurveda. Last year, I had delivered a lengthy talk on Ayurveda at the History Fest organized by the University of West Indies. Let me today present you a gist of that discussion. The coronavirus pandemic has taught us to value a fundamental aspect of human life, its relationship with the environment and its defense mechanism that we call immunity. It taught us that only the science of treatment is not good enough to keep us protected. Possibly, we as a bioorganism need a better interactive natural existence with our environment. The thinking that because we have a brain and we have created robots and supercomputers, we are different from the rest of the organisms in the ecosystem is simply not correct. Like any other bioorganisms, bio we are procreated, we live and we perish. The oldest healthcare system in the world, Ayurveda, believes in this harmonious existence with nature. Ayurveda is derived from the Sanskrit word Ayur, which is life, and Veda, knowledge. It is a system of healthcare and treatment originated in India more than 3,000 years ago. Ayurveda raises the fundamental question of why instead of simply treating a symptom. For instance, it asks, why does a body get flu? And tries to find out how it will not get the flu rather than simply treating the flu by medicine. It tries to find out the cause of the flu and addresses a solution which is out of the nature of plants and herbs and not chemicals. The principle behind diagnosis in modern medical science is similar to what Ayurveda has been practicing, such as pulse, tongue, speech, touch, vision, appearance, and appearance of urine and stool, uh, stool tests. It believes that the human body can maintain a balance within itself and with its natural surroundings. In case of an imbalance, it can be rectified by specific lifestyle interventions, therapies, and natural medicine to regain that balance. A body's constitution, prakriti, and the life forces or doses are the primary basis of Ayurvedic treatment. Ayurveda developed during the Vedic period. Subsequently, Buddhist and Jain monks added to its body of knowledge. The two very important 
medical compendium of Ayurveda are those of Charak and Susruta. They were also translated into Chinese language in 5th century AD. In the 8th century, they were translated into Arabic and Persian languages. The Arabic work eventually reached Europe by 12th century CE. During British colonial rule in India, Western medicine and surgery gained acceptability and popularity. However, after Indian independence, there was a renewed focus on Ayurveda and other traditional medical systems. Ayurveda became a part of Indian national healthcare system. In India, Ayurveda is considered a form of medical care equal to conventional Western medicine. Almost 80% of people of India use Ayurveda exclusively or combined with Western medicine. In 1970, the Indian Medical Central Council Act, which aimed to standardize Ayurveda practitioners' qualifications and provide accredited institutions for its study and research, was passed by India's parliament. In 1971, the Central Council of Indian Medicine, CCIM, was established under the Department of Ayurveda, Yoga, Natur Naturopathy, Yunani, Siddha Medicine, and Homeopathy, which is in short called Ayus, in Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, to monitor higher education in Ayurveda in India. The Indian government supports research and teaching in Ayurveda, the state-sponsored Central Council for Research in Ayurvedic Science is designed to serve this purpose. Many of the public and private hospitals in India have Ayurvedic doctors and pharmacists. Ayurveda doctors undergo rigorous institutionalized training for five years in recognized Ayurvedic medical college with an internship to get a Bachelor of Ayurvedic Medicine and Surgery, BAMS degree. There are reputed Ayurvedic medical college all over India. And a high school student has to pass a national level uh, entrance examination to join one of the colleges. These reputed institutions include the Institute of Medical Science, Banaras Hindu University, Sri Guru Gobind Singh, uh, Tricentenary University, Tilak Ayurved Mahavidyalaya, Patanjali Ayurved uh, College, State Ayurvedic College and hospitals in uh, and KG Mittal Ayurvedic uh, College in India. The argument for Ayurveda and any other alternative medical system is not to discard the Western system of medicine, but to provide more patient options. Some famous Ayurvedic medicines brand are Uniray Life Sciences, Vaidyanath, Dabur India Limited, Hamdar Laboratories, Jhandu Ayurveda, Patanjali Ayurveda, Charak uh, Pharma Private Limited, Himalaya Wellness, Vico uh, Laboratories, and uh, Sandu Pharmaceuticals Limited, along with uh, medications. Ayurveda also employs therapy, yoga, and pranayam, which is breathing exercises. In the Indian subcontinent, Nepal and Sri Lanka also practice Ayurveda. In Nepal, the National Ayurvedic Training and Research Center undertake researches medicinal herbs in Sri Lanka, the Ministry of Health, Nutrition, and Indigenous Medicine looks after the research in Ayurveda through various national research institutes. I'm sure today's discussion will make a valuable contribution to the ongoing global discourse of Ayurveda as a strong pillar of medicine and healthy living. Thank you and Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, for your very profound remarks. Our first presenter is Swami Brahma Swarupananda, the spiritual head at Brahma Vidya Pitam. Swami Brahmade is an educator, philosopher, philanthropist, mystic, and pioneer of spirituality in this new millennium. His natural disposition led him to his mission in life, 
that of promoting happiness, peace, and elevation of the, so of the social and spiritual aspects of mankind. He also holds several positions of great responsibility, which include Peter Dish and founder of Brahma Vidya Pitam International West Indies, coordinator to the Caribbean region and European zone for the World Council of Hindus, as well as vice chancellor of Maharishi Vedic University for the Caribbean. I now invite Swami Brahma Swarupananda to the stage to extend his greetings and deliver his remarks. Namaskar. My respected His Excellency, Sri Arun Kumar Sahuji, all distinguished speaker and then my friend, director, and all the staff of Mahatma Gandhi Sanskritik Sahyog Sansthan. Pahle mene dekh raha tha program, Usara Aurubhid ka ek itihas, uske medicine ka sara present kiya, bohot achcha tha. Hamare Mahamahim ji bohut achcha bol rahe the. Really, I am very, very happy ki our Indian High Commissioner Mahatma Gandhi Sanskritik Sahyog Sansthan, they are celebrating Ayurvedic Day. At the birthday of father of the Ayurveda, Susrut, great scientist Charak, all this great soul, they dedicated whole life behind the Ayurveda. Ayurveda, what is the meaning of Ayurveda? Ayu and Ved. Ayu means life. Ved means science, knowledge. So science of life knowledge of life, but I want to say something. Ki what is the philosophy, what is the meaning of life in Ayurveda? We know life between birth and death, that is span of life, that is span of time with the life, but Ayurveda, a strong rhythm, very great book. Then explain, no. In Ayurveda, life before birth was, after death will exist, that is a life. Ayurveda is thinking, not only at present, but about the past, about the future where our life is related and rooted. So, my dear friend, a knowledge of the life, science of life, life is a big word in Ayurveda. Next thing, we are thinking life, a strong Ayurveda explain life, Two aspect of the life, view of the life, and then view of the life and way of living. If we can understand these two things, view of life and way of living, then we can understand the root of the Ayurvedic philosophy. Ayurvedic medicine I was looking the, all the report that is the essence of our Vedas. I am very happy to come before to see this program. Our Vedas, many countries, they are considering that Veda is a form of 
complementary and alternative medicine, CAM. America also thinking like this, many other countries. But this Susrut Sanghita and the Charak Sanghita, Susrut, in the tradition of Aswani Kumar, two twin brothers, they are founder of the Ayurvedas. From there, then, Susrut, from Susrut and Charak, after the Sarakans, many people is doing experiment behind them. So many books in our list. Then, Ayurveda think, not only body, head, heart, hand, health, and hunger, hunger and nutrition. They are thinking that holistic views of the life because Sharak explained this body, our body, this body needs pleasure. Sense organs need, needs enjoyment. Pleasure, enjoyment. But mind, mind need happiness. But intellect needs peace. But soul, bliss. That is the structure of this human body. Patanjali, Yoga Darshan, given the many divisions of the body, I'm not going to explain that. Ayurveda think body, sense organs, mind, intellect, buddhi, and then soul. Then you can understand what is the human, what is his problem, how to diagnose this, how to solve this problem. Very big thinking, Ayurveda very deep thinking and diagnosis. Diagnosis process, he still made two things, those and dhatu. I was looking at those, vat, pit, and cough. The one to the two, three day lecture that. Dhatu, dhatu money, how body composed of which material? They told dhatu, seven matter, material, they prepare this body. That is a dhatu, plasma, blood, muscles, fat, meda, bone, asthi, marrow, majja, semen, birya. These are the composition of our body. That is a study, the dhatu, dhatu, and then dosa. This telling what to do. Many techniques, all Ayurveda book has given. Medicine, plant-based medicine, not only meditation, meditation and medication, and medi medicine is the root of the same word of Italian language. So, with, if you want to remove your sickness, so do meditation, not only a med, med and mantra also. Mantra is a sound, use the different type of sound. Sound making the word, word making the sentence, sentence making the language. All this Ayurveda philosophy is coming through this process and medicine and then pranayam and yoga. At last he gave panchakarma, five states. So I'm not going to that discuss. In 1970, in India government, 
he prepared Indian Medical Center Council. So they prepared to think about this, but thought was not developed. Then Central Council of Indian Medicine, CCIM, they prepared that started at last in the present Prime Minister period, AUS, A-U-U-S. That is a very big subject word. And the Ayurveda, homeopathy, and naturopathy, vibrational pathy, and not only magnetic therapy, all this together has come in this, in this process. Ayurvedic doctor declare, declare what very nice word I like. I like this. Ayurveda declare food is a medicine. Your food is a medicine. 50% your sickness will be finished through the choose the good food. Food. Second, kitchen is a dispensary. Our kitchen, we have the haldi, black paper, and everything, all spices, and that is a dispensary. We body is the healing itself. Third, body healing himself. Any sickness, first body is a trying. After that, therefore, body is our doctor, own doctor. India, there has, at present, 2,253 Ayurvedic hospital. I found the list that, and 16 postgraduate institution, institution, 432,000 registered Ayurvedic medical doctor, maybe day by day growing, at the period of now, growing, growing, Modi, and then 20 hospital, he sanctioned for the UP only, OP only. And then Ayurveda, Ayurveda, 20 country they recognize. This Hungary, Switzerland, Cuba, Brazil, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, UAE, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Malaysia, Singapore, Mauritius, Serbia, Russia. Russia opening the, then I went there. I went the three year continuously to help the Ayurvedic institution, hospital in Moscow. I was there. And then Tanzania and most country of European, 22 country, five country, they recognize the Ayurvedas. So USA, USA, California College of Ayurveda established very good work they are doing. Australia, the Australian Association of Ayurveda, they are doing very good. And Canada, in 1990, Ayurvedic medical science became more popular in Toronto, Alberta, Colombia, Quebec. Quebec has big center of Ayurveda and people that are coming, Canadian Ayurvedic Medical Alliance, they opened. New Zealand and Dubai. Dubai, the Ministry of the Health gives license of individual to practice Ayurveda medicine. Caribbean Maharshi Mahesh Yogi decided two years before to open the Ayurvedic University here, center here, but suddenly the pandemic problem came. Now stop. But we have them. So, last, differences in Western medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. Ayurvedic is a comprehensive cure, inclusive. And then Western medicine, a dimensional cure, exclusive. Inclusive and exclusive. Western medicine is filled with chemical. And Ayurvedic drug, rejuvene, no reaction. No reaction, but here there is a reaction. Ayurvedic treatment has both biological and spiritual, but Western medicine only biological, physiological, anatomical. And they have a technology and then devices. They are taking experiments, then they are giving the medicine. It's spiritual, 
and biological. Very nice word I want to present. I like that word. Mahatma Gandhi and Einstein, they discussing the letter through the letter. At last, Einstein wrote, Gandhi, I like religious science and scientific religion. Okay? He gave thanks. But when the uh, Ravinna Tagore went and they discussed to many what is the truth, what is a man, what is a creation, that please you read that. At last, Einstein told, I believe in spiritual science and scientific spirituality. He, that is his word. My Ayurved is a spiritual science and scientific spirituality. Due to this, we like the Ayurveda. Ayurvedic in modern age, many people did hard work. Maharshi Bahes Yogi, he did pulse training everywhere, pulse diagnosis. And he teaching, we are yeah, Nadi Vigyan. Tony Nadar, many books he wrote on Ayurvedas. And then they founded American Association Ayurvedic Medicine and wrote many books. Swami Ramadev is doing medicine. Dabar, Vaidyanath, many, many organizations, they are doing the good work. So my dear friend, at last, subject is a Ayurveda for the portion. Portion means how pushy. Kaise ham majboot banenge? Hamara bal kaise badega? Strength kaise badega? So bal or apka jo oj bal oj or tej. Ye tien ko badhata hai. Usko ham kehte hain portion. Pushy. Portion kehte hain. Or, is ko bahut acha nutrition and then holistic and then nutrition. So, my dear friend, Brahma Vidya Pitham, Ayurvedic Center, he has the plan totally to open. I went to the before, here, education minister, ki I want to open. So, I know Ayurvedic name you can't open. Maybe my Indian High Commissioner will be helpful for me. They told, wellness, with the name of center of wellness, you can open, not Ayurveda. So I realize he doesn't know anything. Due to this, he's giving answer like this. So my dear friend, whole world, now I'm giving thanks to Dhanavantari birthday. He's a great soul to Jadhanteras. Your property, not only material property, spiritual property, dhan should grow. That is my prayer. At last, I am doing to pranam to everybody. Hari Om Tassat Sarave Bhantu Sukhina Sarave Santu Niramaya. Everybody happy and everybody be healthy, happy, in harmony. Hari Om Tassat. Thank you, Swamiji, for your very in-depth presentation. Our next presenter is independent senator, Dr. Varma Dial Singh. Dr. Dial Singh is no stranger in the field of medicine, as he was awarded the very prestigious National Award of the Hummingbird Gold Medal in 2018 for a service rendered in the field of medicine. Dr. Dial Singh is also a columnist with the Trinidad Guardian newspaper and a psychiatrist by profession who serves on various committees dealing with mental health and community issues. I now welcome Dr. Dial Singh on stage to deliver his remarks. His Excellency, thank you for inviting me here, Swamiji. Thank you for the words you have given us. When I was invited here to give this lecture on Ayurvedic medicine, one of my colleagues asked me, why are you coming here? It's herbs. What do you want to know about herbs? Trinidad has their own herbs and herbal medication. We know about Vivine for, for producing breast milk. Well, the men in the audience are about Bob and Bach for sexual prowess, and that's our local Viagra, if you all didn't know. And there, there are aloes that we use, a lot of herbs we use here. So they said, why come here? So I mentioned to the doctor, I said, Ayurvedic medicine 
or Ayurveda itself is not just herbs, it's a way of life, it's a culture, it's a story of thousands of years, how medicine developed, the history of medicine. It's a story of European domination and discrimination. It's a story of pharmacological um, monopolies. All that is in this Ayurvedic medicine and the whole history. And as I start, I have to say that I entered the medical field around in 1980. I started as a medical student. So my years of, of, of being a, a medical in, um, a student in turn, I've seen a lot. And there was one case I saw, a 26-year-old girl, she had, she couldn't even close her wrist. She was a teacher. She couldn't hold her chalk. She actually suffered from rheumatoid arthritis, a severe form, 26-year-old. The rheumatologist treated her with steroids, prednisolone. She got cataracts in her eyes. She got um, bleeding ulcers, bone loss. She developed something called Cushing syndrome, major side effects. She then went on an anti-cancer tablet called methotrexate. She had liver problem after two years. She couldn't use it. She migrated to Canada. And years later, by chance, she got my email and said, Doc, I'm good and I'm, I'm settled. I said, but how come? We ran out of options here. She went into Ayurvedic medicine. So in Canada, something remarkable happened. And since then, I realized there is a place for everything. There is a place in this earth for all cultures. Anything that you can garner from any culture, you could bring in once it helps mankind. You see, the future of medicine determines the future of man. Uh, the invisible foe, the COVID-19 virus has shown us it has a, 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 the ability to de decimate the world. We have about 1,709 cases, persons died here, 5 million globally. And I don't want to be a negative um, person or suits here, but I predict some of our participants here right now would one day get the infected, and I hope not with a fatal outcome. So we live in an uncertain, we live in dangerous times. Our lack of ICU beds is a disgrace to a country where billions of petroleum dollars went through. It's a disgrace. Entire, entire families are being wiped out. And even if you get the vaccine, you are still not safe, safe. So we still need to wear masks, social distance, and sanitize. But it was frightening to see our world leaders in that conference of the parties, the, the, the COP26 summit, all without masks, hugging each other, no social distance. I know a few leaders, they already had COVID. They were infected. They should be exemplars. They should be displaying more caution to their citizens. So I was amazed when I saw that, disappointed, because if any leader gets infected with the fatal outcome, it would mar this important conference. And this conference is important. Why? Because global warming, climate change is so important. Any sort of rise in Earth's temperature will cause pests to come out. We see in penal, locusts, snails, other pests ravaging the producer of farmers. We see that the disease, destruction, distress of flood, global warming, rising um, tides. You find these are things that will affect us. Um, the heated, dry season. We see bushfires, we saw floods, torrential rains, not just in Trinidad, we saw in Europe, in Germany, places actually had major, major fallout of, the, of this um, climate change. But you see, Ayurvedic study begin with the philosophy and principles of yoga, the ethics of the yamas, the yamas started with non-violence and truthfulness. So it's a way of life. But the Ayurveda also teaches us to honor Mother Nature and her processes and respect all life as sacred down to the earth itself. Her plants, her soil, waters, all this teaches us to respect our environment. If, and if only the world leaders had learned about this before, we may not have been in such a dire climatic state. We are reaping our disrespect to Mother Nature. So when I look at, at what happened, in the world, what's happening in terms of climate, what's happening in terms of health, we have to realize that human health is one of the most important factors influencing economic development in an economy. Right now, there's poverty. With poverty, gets the social ill effects. And our world leaders really need to build a community with a shared future for humanity. Now, the thing is, if you have a comorbid problem, diabetes, high blood pressure, and other illness, you could succumb to the COVID virus easier. So how do we get a healthy nation? Because Trinidad is in a state where you have, not only Trinidad, worldwide, you have, there's a great economic burden that affects us in the world. Right now, Trinidad and Tobago, you have the diseases, the non-communicable diseases that affects us. You have diseases like, like high blood pressure, um, diabetes. All of these things 
could affect us, and all of these things are preventable if you develop a proper, uh, a, pr a proper technique, a proper way to manage yourself. So when I look at the fact that we are now in times where we cannot even get supply of medicine, there's a, there's, a, there's a supply problem to get medical equipment, all these are problems. And the World Health Organization actually, you know, when they came about in 1948, they defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Well, the Ayurvedas had this concept thousands of years ago. The mind, the body, the, 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 that, 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 that um, sort of coordination, it, thousands of years they had it. So what the WHO now came about with, it was there in this literature. So therefore, we have to realize that we should now try to adopt the Ayurvedic way of life, not only because getting better health, but because the economic viability of the nation, all countries should look at this. Swamiji mentioned different countries are adopting this, and they should adopt it. And, and the thing is, if we could only put the foundations of Ayurveda as part of our deeper education, and I think this is something years ago the university started, and I want to end with that when I'm coming. So now, yeah, fantastic breakthroughs in medical future. India is leading. So right now, we have communication advances, smartphone, tablets. I don't need to go and see a patient. I could go on my phone and actually see the patient's health status thousands of miles away. I can actually reduce the need to travel for me and a patient in these COVID times. So we have advances. We have communication advances. I think the four great advances we have is communication advances, 3D printers. We can now make prosthetic heart valves in ours, prosthetic limbs. Um, the advances again, we see something called deep brain stimulation, a technique where you can actually, people with Parkinson's, Torres syndrome, people with depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, you stimulate places in the brain that could help um, these conditions. And robotics mentioned by his excellence, robotic surgery, there's nano robots that could, you know, nano robotics that can go in and actually clear up clots and the next five years, we are hoping we can get a breakthrough with Alzheimer's. So even though we have all these wonderful things on the horizon, and India is leading in our, most of these advances, but we have to realize way in the back, way in the past, 3,000 years ago, we had the answers there already. Because health has a great economic burden, you know. The CDC said that, you know, they spend billions annually on cancer, billions in diabetes, you know, um, you know and even Trinidad and Tobago, there's a great economic burden before the COVID-19, it was 8.7% you know, you, you had um, allocated from the, the budgetary allowance. We have to realize adopting a healthy lifestyle will help us prevent monies going into this. We have major illnesses in Trinidad and Tobago, major illnesses in the world, and adopting this would definitely help us. In Trinidad and Tobago, if you realize ischemic heart disease is a leading cause of death since um, between 2000 and 2019, and therefore, you have to learn the fact that we can help starve off these diseases. Now, Ayurveda practitioners develop certain medical, like herbal, um, herbs that they use in their practice, breathing techniques, surgical procedures, and this is the amazing thing. You see, so it's not just herbal medicine, special diets, meditation, yoga, massage. We saw the massage there, that, that, that massage we saw there would actually come like if you're in a sauna, it make, makes your body sweat out the toxins. But Ayurveda is a holistic approach, a holistic approach where we now in medicine are trying to reinvent the wheel and say that. So for poor citizens waiting cataract surgery, imagine if someone told you 3,000 years ago, you could have gotten cataract surgery in India. Cataract surgery in India, they had a technique where they would have gone remove the lens 3,000 years ago. And this is the, the wonder of, 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 the, of India. So it's not just that herbal aspect, it's the surgical. They were, went after kidney stones. They did wonders. Some of the conditions they had, eh, some symptoms they actually had written down were fever, cough, consumption, which is TB, diarrhea, dropsy, abscesses, seizures, tumors, leprosy. All those were described 3,000 years ago. Surgical treatment, plastic surgery. Um, tonsillectomy, couching is the cataract surgery, um, releasing fluid from the abdomen where we do in the hospitals when we want to take out ascites, uh, treatment of anal fistulas, something where you get a crack in the anus where you have pain, um, treating fractures, amputation, caesarean section, suturing of wounds, all this was there. And they also had prescribed treatment for angina, which is heart, uh, pectoris, 
um, diabetes, hypertension, and kidney stones. So imagine all of this before. Imagine all of this greatness before that we had. And, you know, this was really developed out of the Hindu civilization years ago. And remember, they had great civilizations then. You had the Egyptian, the Mesopotamia, you had the Hindu civilization. But you see, when conquering um, nations went into countries, they destroyed all the records in, um, in Egypt, Alexander the Great. They suppressed it. That is what you call the European conquest, where you would not look at the natives, uh, their, um, anything good coming out of them. You would, you would go into countries like India and say they are he they're heathens, they are pagans, and you don't consider them. So their literature cannot be good. They came here and there was genocide of the Amerindians. So that was something that the world has to realize and recognize. You do not do destroy things that could have helped persons. So therefore, the Ayurvedic um, you know, techniques, there, there are eight components. There's, the, there's, there's one where I think there's a slide there that I would have had there, where the Kaya Chikita, Chiksa, you must um, please uh, my pronunciation. That actually component looked at general medicine, medicine of the body. Then there's Kuma um, Baitra, obstetrics, gynecology, pediatrics. They talk about prenatal, postnatal care of the baby, methods of conception, childhood disease, midwifery. Then there's the, the, the Salia Tantra, surgical techniques, extraction of foreign objects. Then there's the, the Shalakya Atta Antra. So you must forgive me of it, but that's an ENT study of disease, ENT study and disease of the eye, nose, and throat. Then there's the one with the publication of the mines. They look at of, of epidemics, toxins in animals, vegetables, minerals, um, rejuvenation, and tonics. All the tonics we are seeing here um, for intellect and strength. When you look at hemoglobin and these things, they had the answers. Aphrodisiac treatments, Viagra. Well, they had aphrodisiac there. So they had the answers for a lot of things, a lot of things. And now we in modern medicine, we are to speaking of the biopsychosocial model, we had that thousands of years ago. And when you looked at the balance, and you're talking about the you need balance combination, this is what we try to achieve when we have patients, get the mind to go in sync with the body, and you'd see, when you're stressed out, you get stomach problem. Um, when you're in love, butterflies, the mind could affect you. The, this technique here actually addresses all. It's a fine-tuned medicine, uh, medicine also. Because you see, um, part of the, the the specialist then, what, what those Ayurveda doctors would have looked at is treat each person as an individual. So not a general treatment, so a fine-tuned medicine. Because each one, they will now look at their body, their constituents, and they will figure this is the best treatment for you. And isn't it true we all have different fingerprints, we all have genetic material? But right now, genetic um, therapy looks at individualized treatment. They had it then. They would actually learn and gather knowledge how to treat somebody based on the different factors they would use. And remember, they had ways to diagnose illness. They looked at the pulse, they looked at the urine, they looked at the stool, they looked at the tongue, they looked at speech, um, touch, vision, all these things we do in, in medicine now. They, they, remember, a dark urine could be jaundice. The tongue has seven disorders in medicine we learn. Speech, you could see if you had thyroid problem where you speak slow, stroke. Touch, we look at nerve disorders, stroke, vision, cataract. All these were techniques they had how to examine people. So it was amazing they would have done this. The appearance, all these things were amazing things. So therefore, they actually looked at senses, how to actually diagnose certain things, like, like, like the breathing and all these things. So they, they actually had not just the dietary aspects and the herbal aspects, but the medicinal aspects, which I think it is wonderful. They actually had, had alcohol uh, called madhya, which is a fermented drink where you use in certain of the Ayurvedic texts. And, 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 and they also use opium um, to in some of their um, uh, uh, med medicinal um, ingredients. And remember, we use opium and morphine and panadine for pain and treatment. Cannabis, which remember we... Um, decriminalized marijuana, they had it actually in the treatment of diarrhea and aphrodisia. They also had a wonderful uh, um, guideline to stop traumatic bleeding. You get a cut, they actually describe how to ligate the blood vessels, how to cauterize it by heat. And remember, right now, cautery mas machine is a standard thing in operating theaters. They had it years ago, uh, how um, um, poultice to stop um, constrict the blood vessels and, um, and, and stop clotting. So therefore, besides all this f fascinating um, um, features they had, we had to realize, as, as His Excellency said, it was spread to China. It went to Europe. And in Europe, actually, there was a Joseph Constantine Capru. He studied plastic surgery methods in India for 20 years, in 1815. And he went back, and he actually learned to do nasal reconstruction, nasal re 
construction. And he got fame for it, but he went to India to learn these techniques. Michael Jackson is very grateful to the Indian technology because Michael Jackson, who changed his nose a few times. But as I want to say now, the, 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 the trinity of Ayurvedic knowledge comes from Shushruta. Shushruta was an ancient Indian physician and surgeon, and he's known as the father of surgery and the father of plastic surgery, father of brain surgery. His work was considered the oldest text in plastic surgery. Um, Charaka was root and medicine and healthy lifestyles. And, and uh, Charaka, to me, stands as a, as, as, as a, as in medicine, I would never give an ode to Hippocrates again. This gentleman here, Charaka, if you read his writings, he is the true father of medicine, not Hippocrates. So Eurocentric dissemination of information, we need to correct it. We need to see who is the father of surgery. We need to see who is the father of medicine. And so there was three of them, actually, who actually were influential writers in the Ayurveda. So therefore, we have to see that we, we look at history as it is. And I, I, I say, uh, in conclusion, I have to say that a few years ago, there was a trust to set up a chair in the University of the West Indies to teach Ayurvedic medicine. I think it was um, Dr. Sa Saran Singh was also instrumental in assisting with this venture. But what had happened is I think the university said they will set up this chair and I think it was somebody had left. So we needed somehow to get back somebody as an, an Indian national to be able to carry on this and to, to, to go forward. And the next step would have been for the overall academic board of UV to approve delivery of this, um, of this um, new um, you know, uh, faculty that we were offering in, in the medical faculty, the, 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 the new um, um, teachings. And I'm saying we need to go there because it is definitely a fascinating culture, a fascinating book. It's definitely some, uh, a, a culture that was, as I say, discriminated by European history. It was, it was for instance, you know, um, put aside, but we have to come now and say, listen, those techniques were discovered in India thousands of years ago. Medical wise persons have to come out now and say, give the credit where it's due. So all in all, we have to force for this, and I beg you, His Excellency, to see if you can get back this chair, get persons here, and I thank you for having me here. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Dial Singh, for sharing your knowledge with us. Our next presenter is a graduate of the University of the West Indies and is currently a specialist in bioenergetic medicine at the Ishtara Medical Limited in Chaguanas. Ladies and gentlemen, I now invite on stage Dr. Chabinat Hari Ramarain. Your Excellency, Dr. Kumar Sahu, specially invited guests to the left, to my left, and all of you wonderful people who are here to make this program a special occasion. Thank you for coming here. And also thank you for having me here as well. I'm going to start. By just reminding us ourselves for what has been said before that Ayurveda equals science of life. For the last 40 years in my life, I graduated about 45 years ago. And so the last 40 years in my life, I've been looking at the science of life. Now, science and spirituality belong to the same coin. They are two sides of the same coin. In my work and in my study and my research, science is extremely spiritual, and this has been already said a while ago. And my spirituality is extremely scientific. If we look at that, the science of life or science of life, then all methods of medicine should adopt that position. We cannot escape that. What I have to present to you in the next few minutes is a sum summary, I would say it's one slide of what I've been doing for the last 40 years. My objective has been to bring Ayurveda into the 21st century. Let us, let us look at the universe. Everything in the universe is made up of three components. You can call it the holy triad. It's matter, energy, and information. If you take a piece of copper on your hand, and you look at that as material, as matter, then you have an energy component to it. And you also have an informational component to that. 
That's the holy triad. You cannot have matter without actually having vibration or energy, and you cannot have matter without information. We live in a world where that has become a reality. So let us further look at matter and energy and information. Most of my work has been in the sphere of physics and mathematics. I'll tell you why. It's interesting that if you want to study the physical body, the basic bi science is biology or physiology, and you can add biochemistry and so on. But if you want to study the vibrational aspect of life or the energy aspect of life in a living organism, then you have to study biophysics. And that's what I've been doing for the last 40 years. If you want to study the informational aspect of ourselves, which is based, basically all our programs from the time we are born to this time now, then it's all pure mathematics. And that has been my study as well. Now, let's take the human body. We look at it and we see it as a physical structure. But I want to remind you that this body that you have at your here sitting is not a physical body where it is all matter. In fact, I can tell you that 70% of your body is water. And I, can, I will repeat this twice so you never forget this. Water is liquid light. Water is liquid light. And then you have an informational field which we generally tend to loosely call our soul, so to speak. But that's where all our programs have been held. From the time we are born, we are program, all program beings. Now, this physical body is also made up, apart from all the physical structure, is made up of actually seven energy centers. You can call them seven spiritual centers. And I'm not going to go into detail, but I'll just give you a snippet of what we have found in our research and how it influences our practice. The lower five chakras from the throat downwards, they all control the physical body from head to toe. The brow chakra is related to your mind, it's related to your awareness, to your consciousness. And that's an expansive field. It's way beyond these five chakras. And the one above your head is called the crown chakra. And that is the one that connects us to the divine level. And that brings us to an interesting place, to talk a little bit about the quantum field. The quantum field is space. We live in space. That's to the ordinary human being. But the quantum field is a way more than that. The quantum field is the God field. We are living in that. It contains everything in the universe. It's an aspect of God that I call the unknown. If we can refer to the divine as the unknowable, we live in this quantum field. To some people, it's called heaven. It is infinite. You can take a spacecraft and go travel at the speed of light, and you will never reach the end of this quantum field. It's the most mysterious thing. We live in that quantum field. The biggest problem of all of us here is that we are not connected to it. We have been taught and programmed to be disconnected, to see it as separate from us. In fact, everything that is matter is also energy and is also information. So if your body is matter and you are materialized and this physical world is a material world, the quantum field is the next level. It's the next step. It is a higher vibrational aspect of the physical world. Now, I just want to say to you, explain to you that there are two things that we need to understand in the human body from a cellular point of view. One is light. And I'll tell you about light. Light is basically for function. So every cell in your body generates light and it's called biophotons. And light is for function. The more light you have, the more efficient your cells can function. Now, over the years, I've looked at my practice and I've seen people in their you know, 80s and 70s and so on. And I've been in practice for 45 years. So you've seen people aging. I've also seen people with high energy levels very high energy levels. But with time, I've also noticed that people, their bodies are deteriorating. And I wondered about that. And that led me to an intense study for the last 20-something years, looking at why 
even though our chi, our prana, or our mana, which is from heaven, all of it comes from the quantum field, why is it that we have a high energy level, but our bodies are still deteriorating? And then I started to research something that very few people have researched on the planet so far. I found another type of energy released by yourself. I will call that dark energies. And we tend to look at darkness as if it's something negative. I can tell you that the original state of the universe is darkness. The original state of this room is dark. And so I started using algorithms to identify, and for the last 20 years, looking at that, I discovered a new energy at a cellular level, which I have named DX3. It's not published anywhere. We have discovered that. When we started looking at that in the human body, we found that the average level on a scale 1 to 10 is like 2 out of 10, which means it is so low, that's why our bodies are deteriorating. That brings us to an interesting program that all of us here sitting have been installed with from birth. It's called 3Ds, disease, degeneration, and death. I wouldn't say much about that, except that that's the program that's running us. I have started a project, started on the 25th of January last year, to work with human beings in Trinidad and Tobago to remove that program by the year 2030. It's a 10-year project. And we are going to continue working and researching until we find the ways to do it. Today, I'll give you some snippets of how you can do that. Now, that energy is for regeneration of this physical body, dark energies. We listen, this is a time of Diwali, and we listen to all the time for many years in my life, light overcomes darkness. That is not true. Darkness is the most powerful that we have in the universe. Out of darkness comes light. So there are two types of energy. Now, the next point I want to raise about that is very interesting. And that is, how do we look at these two energies in our system? And we come back to Ayurveda. Some years ago, I read Nikola Tesla, a brilliant mind in the West, he actually said, if you know the magnificence of three, six, and nine, you have the key to the universe. Well, I have spent over 30 years trying to understand what that meant, until some years ago I discovered what he meant. If you write a three, it's like this, it's moving to the right. And if you write a six, it's moving to the left. And if you write a nine, they cancel each other. In the universe, everything has spin. We're talking quantum physics today. It is very, very different from what we know in Western medicine. The Ayurvedic sages and saints and rishis knew what I'm talking about. Three, six, and nine are two, three different spin. Everything in the universe is made up of spin. At an atomic level, electrons are spinning around the nucleus. Water moves and swirls in a spinning fashion. The earth is spinning around. Everything is spin. When you pass, all of you pass urine, it never comes out in a straight line. It's in a spiral. Everything is spin. I will now explain to you. Medicines, all medicines that we know in, medicine, in medical field today, is either right spin, left spin, or zero spin. All right spin medicines are pathological in nature. Every single drug that is made by a pharmaceutical company is all right spin. And I'm not saying any, anything is wrong with that. As I said, medicine can be right spin, and there's a, a place for it. Homeopathic medicines are all right spin, because homeopathic medicine is based on this concept of similia similibus curantia which means like curing like. So if you have a disease pathology in your body, X, then you give X, and they cancel each other off. It's all quantum stuff. But Western medicine doesn't understand quantum physics and its application in medicine, unfortunately. 
Right spin medicines attack diseases. If you have an inflammation, you use an anti-inflammatory. In the same way, homeopathic medicines attack diseases, like curing, like they collapse each other. And that's the two basic medicines that are right spin. Left spin medicine, on the other hand, all comes from the great energies of the cosmos, especially the sun, the quantum field. And left spin medicines are basically considered food. Someone many years ago said, let thy food be thy medicine, or let food be thy medicine. Medicine as food is a bit slow. It works, but it takes a long time. Not as fast as homeopathic medicines or Western pharmaceutical medicine. All right? Food. All food, whether it's water, that's considered food, whether it is a plant, a herb, everything that comes out of the sun is all left spin. And that's a six. Homeopathic medicines, Western pharmaceutical medicines, all, number three, right spin. But there's something very interesting that we discovered, and that is zero spin. And that's the number nine, the magic of the number nine. Nine is the most spiritual number that we know. If you take any number between one and nine, let's say you, you can take any number, you can take five, nine multiplied by five equals 45, which is a nine. And nine added to five equals 14, which is a back to five. So nine has the power to make all of us here, ourselves as we are, but at the same time, the divine. Zero spin medicine, and that's where, what the research I've done, I've been using those medicines for years now in Trinidad. Zero spin medicine are the most divine medicine. The word medicine and the word meditation, they come from the, exactly the same root word. When the mind, Patanjali, the great sage and Rishi who brought yoga into the world, he said, yoga is the cessation of the mind. When the mind stops, when the mind is still, you are connected. I think there's a verse somewhere in the Christian Bible that says, be still and know that I am God. It's written in their own literature as well, sacred literature. So zero spin medicines are the most powerful. In Ayurveda, what I have found so far in all the remedies that are created, most of them are left spin. But there are some individuals who knew how to mix things, and I, it was mentioned before by Swamiji. If you know how to mix medicine, you can bring them to zero spin. And when you can bring them to zero spin, zero spin is actually what takes us to the source of all life. So there's another paradigm that we are talking about. The paradigm of the divine, and if you want to use the word God, it's okay, life and health. There is absolutely no death in God. We have accepted death in our, to a large extent, and I'm not going to go too far into that, because, but that's maybe for another time, if you want to discuss the findings and the research in spirituality and science that we've conducted over the last 40 years. That's why I'm interested in helping people to remove the programming of 3Ds by the year 2030. Interestingly, let's go back now to look at the zero spin medicine. There are a number of things I will just explain to you. And if you were to hum, you generate zero spin in your body. So if you were to take a deep breath and you hum, you generate a tone on the musical scale and a frequency which actually activates dark energies. Zero spin medicines, all of them, and techniques generates dark energies, which is totally different from light. And the more dark energies your cells can produce, more light you can produce. At that time, when your dark energy starts to increase, you need less food, you need less sleep, because during sleep you generate dark energies. And I will just e explain to you a little bit more about dark energies. If you have a mango seed and you want to generate mangoes in the future, you have to plant it. It, you have to put it in the dark energies of the earth, where the sleep, the life, 
the divine, which is asleep in the seed, comes to life. When a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, it goes in the dark energies of the cocoon. And there it gets transformed completely. All of you sitting here at one time, you got half a cell from your mother, half from your father. And you make one cell. Under the microscope, you have no liver, you have no brain, you have no toenails, no limbs. But in nine months, roughly, in the dark energies of your mother's womb, which is where the divine power is in a, in a woman, a man doesn't have it. A woman has it. In that dark energies of the mothers in your mother's womb, that cell becomes a complete human being that you are here. It's all darkness. Darkness can never be overcome at all. Some of you might know it as truly what the meaning of Kali is in the universe. And let me explain something to you about the immune system and dark energies. When your immune system has to fight disease, it's a fight. It creates and generates inflammation. And today, all of you here are continuously running a strong immune system, fighting things constantly. When you get to these people on the left-hand side where you are calm and you relax and you're in tune with the divine, your immune system does not have to function. It is like the guards at Buckingham Palace. They are on guard, they are alert, and they don't have to do anything. When you start to produce dark energies, I'll tell you what happens. Anything that is against life, anything that will destroy life, in the presence of dark energies, these cells, whether it's a bacteria or virus, or even a parasite, they will apoptose and they will break down back to an original cell, which brings me to talk about God cells inside of all of us. We have discovered that. We've been researching that for the last 30 years. I first came across this in Germany under a, 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 a teacher, a researcher. He called it endobions. Endo meaning from within, bios is life. In the modern world, we, we refer to those God cells as microbiome. Just by the way, all of you sitting here, you have over 60 trillion cells which you got from your parents, from the single cell. But you are also carrying inside of all of you over 600 trillion other cells, which I have called the God cells. They are all inside of you. Listening and waiting, they are all activated by one thing only, and that's dark energies. And all of you sitting here, if you measure the dark energies, and we have created algorithms to do that, if you create, if you measure them, they're extremely low in all of us, except that you're in meditation for a long time. Then you start to produce dark energies. Actually, the average human being is producing a small amount of dark energies only during sleep. And you can generate more the darker the bedroom. All right? So I'm just going to stop at this point and the, before I, before I finish, to mention to you that you, all of you here, can actually, when I look at the future of mankind, I will tell you what I see in the future. And all of this has come from over 40 years of sitting in the silence every single day. The microbiome in your body can be activated. And here's what. People talk about heaven, people talk about reincarnation. They are both true. How can they be true? We already live in heaven. As we lift our vibrational level, we become more in tune with it. Reincarnation, it is also true. But I can tell you, the future of humanity, from the way we see it today, is that your body can be transformed right here. Remade, every cell, every organ can be remade using the God cells that you already carry. God cells exist everywhere. They exist in water. Everywhere there's fluid in your body, you have these cells. They range from nanoparticle size to bacteria size. But they are waiting and listening only to the program that is going on in your life. You have everything in your life to remake this body. Someday, some of you here would attain that. If I don't attain it, that's okay. It doesn't bother me. Because the future of humanity is myself too. So I've started that project, and 
start a project so that we can lift our lives to reach a, high, a higher vibrational level where, guess what? We can enter the quantum field and disappear. As if you go through a door and you close the door, you're no longer in the room. And you can come back when you want. That's the future of humanity. We are still a long way from that. I just want to share with you a few things before I finish. And just to show you, light is interesting. You cannot see any light emanated from this. But in total darkness, this is literally screaming of light. I will, I will demonstrate by putting some light on it, and then you can see. It's a very rare stone. You can see fluorescent light coming out of it. You can see that. But in total darkness, you don't have to put light. This is a zero spin stone. We have been looking, we have been looking, I'll leave that for just a, at the end. I have a few products here. All of you can use these products. These are all zero spin, and you can make them yourself. This contains three ingredients. Turmeric, coriander, and ginger. Mixed in equal proportions, and you can take this every day. It is food, but it is zero spin. And zero spin connects you to the quantum field, which is the God field. That's one example. Remember that. Everybody talks about cholesterol. This is ghee I made last week. This is a zero spin food, highly spiritual food. I'd encourage all of you to use ghee every day, a small amount. If you want to use it, you take a teaspoon in your mouth, chew it like if you're salivating it until it's absorbed by the saliva, then you swallow it. Excellent. This will not cause heart disease in anybody. It, but it is filled with cholesterol. But it, I have been testing hundreds, thousands of patients over the last 40 years. I have never found this to be affecting anybody's coronary arteries. I, I use ghee on a regular basis. If you're going to use ashwagandha, and bacopa, I would suggest you use them together because by themselves they're all left spin. When you bring them together and you take them together in your stomach, they become zero spin. So then you have a very powerful Ayurvedic zero spin food, which is all purely spiritual. And last, I've started a project to lift the vibration of the people in this country, and it's a very simple process. You see, meditation is not difficult. It's not easy, sorry. It's not easy. You can be meditating for 20 years and you still don't get it. So all of you can walk home from here today, but you use a technology, which is a motor vehicle, and you can get home quickly and safely. I'll share with you a technology. Right now I'm working with a few people in India through an Indian woman, and we are looking at mathematics, geometry, and this is a stone cut. We just got this a few days ago from India, made like this. We are looking at the exact geometry. And all you need, this is a technology to connect you to the God field, a, a technology to connect you to the quantum field. If you sit quietly and you just hold this in your hands and you can close your eyes, within a few minutes, the technology would li literally reduce your brain wave from the beta level, the alpha brain wave state, into the theta and delta. You can even fall asleep. But as you get to a lower vibrational level, you will connect to the divine level. So as I share with you a technology. We are just to today finished working out the exact dimension. You see, you can call it a lingam. And people, mo most people will refer to it as if it's a masculine thing. This is not masculine. This is utterly feminine. The feminine takes you within. The masculine takes you outwards. So I see this a little bit differently. And this technology came from India. Today we are now re rethinking the whole process, looking at the exact geometrical pattern of it. And we're going to bring in as much as we can, done in the right way, made in India, and this is a gift from the Ayurvedic system, from the ancient seers and rishis from the past. But we are now redefining it exactly. And just holding this every single day, 15 minutes to half an hour, 
It will get you to the place where you want to be. It will transform your life. With that, I want to thank all of you for being here. And I hope I've given you a snippet to open your minds a little bit more, start thinking a bit deeply. This is all Ayurvedic. The word Ayurveda is science of life, the understanding of life. And that's just my snippet that I have to share with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramnarayan, for your contribution. Ladies and gentlemen, next on the program, we have Dr. Prativiraj Bahadur Singh a pediatrician and lecturer in child health at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Dr. Bahadur Singh completed his MBBS at UWE in 2000 and subsequently specialized in pediatrics and subspecialized in community pediatrics in the UK. Dr. Bahadur Singh also completed a diploma in Ayurveda at the Middlesex University in the UK and is a keen advocate for improving services for children with disability. So without further delay, I now welcome Dr. Bahadur Singh on stage. Hello, namaste. Um, I'll be not on stage. I'll be on the floor with everyone. Um, I'm actually here today um, to speak a little bit about Ayurvedic healthy living. And the, the perspective I will take today will be more from a preventative healthcare perspective. I'm actually here representing Chimaya Mission. Swami Prakashan Energy couldn't be here today, so I'm here on his behalf. Um, I'll just start with a very short prayer before I um, actually start. Om Shri Ganesha Namaha. Om Shri Saraswati Namaha. Om Shri Gurave Namaha. Om Tat Purushaya Vidmahe. Amrita Kalasha Hastaya Dimahi. Dhanno Dhanvantri Prachodayate Hari Om Okay, so we're going to start um, speaking about um, Ayurvedic medicine preventative healthcare. So that mantra that I just chanted is a Gayatri mantra to Dhanvantri who is the considered to be an incarnation of Lord Vishnu and he's the originator of Ayurveda in the original sense. Now, there's a term there. It says Amrita, Kalasha, Hastaya. Hasta means hand, and Kalasha in Trinidad, we say, we say Kalsa in Trinidad. We're doing puja, we say Kalsa. Um, but Kalash is, the, is the, um, the container. You can see it there. The Kalsa in his hand, Kalash. And it contains Amrita. So I don't know if, Dr. Ramnarine, if that Amrita is the zero spin that you're talking about, you know, <laughs> in, in, the, in the hand there of... Um, Dhanvantri, Sri Dhanvantri. He's an incarnation of Lord Vishnu. And that Amrita, um, the, the highest Amrita in human existence is of the nature of the Atman, the soul, right? We say God realization, we say Nirvana, many, many different ways that it can be described. In the Yoga Shastras of Sri Patanjali Yoga Shastras, you know, the, the state of Samadhi is well described in all our traditions. So actually, the highest form of health in Ayurveda is the state of God-realization, self-realization. This is the highest state of health. So that, that, that is the highest state of health in Ayurveda. And Ayurveda comes from the Vedas. The, the philosophical portion of the Vedas are the Upanishads, and the Upanishads clearly describe the state of God-realization and self-realization. This is the highest health. So I want to start at the highest level as we go further to speak about Ayurveda healthy living. So as I mentioned before, we know Ayu means life and Veda means knowledge. Now when we say Ayurvedic medicine, you know, I'm a, I'm a medical practitioner in the Western field. But when we say Ayurvedic medicine, we actually limit Ayurveda. Because medicine in the Western sense of the word, we think of therapeutics. And Ayurveda is knowledge for life, physical, mental, and spiritual. So, you know, we shouldn't just try to fit Ayurveda into a Western medical fold because the, the breadth of Ayurveda is much, much more than that. And also, too, in Western medicine, to give a holistic understanding, we say holistic health. We have to add holistic to health to remind Western practitioners that health should be holistic. In fact, in modern medical practice, we practice therapeutics, but we actually ignore preventative health care and we ignore the, the holistic aspect of medicine. It's, it's, a, it's a sad reality, but that's what's happening now. Even in terms of health care, we spend money to build hospitals, we spend money in secondary healthcare, and we don't put enough emphasis in preventative healthcare. This is where Ayurveda has excellent 
potential in, in, in the whole world, preventative health care. You know, I'm a pediatrician, so I see kids, I, I see kids. You know, why wait till we have diabetes and hypertension when we could deal with health from very early? That's where we have to start, preventative health care in the young. Before we get to all these diseases that we encounter now, which are going to cripple our, our economies, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, is all going to cripple our economies because of the morbidity that they cause. So as mentioned before, World Health Organization defines health as physical, mental, and social well-being. But it's pretty clear it, it does not include spiritual well-being. And this is an important omission in the WHO definition of health. Ayurveda clearly um, defines health and it incorporates the spiritual aspect. So um, in, according to Shushruta, in his definition of health, he uses the word sum, summer. Summer means equipoise, equilibrium, you know, um, well-functioning, healthy. So it says summer dosha. The word dosha is something that applies to all of us. Um, we all have the three doshas, which is vata, pitta, kapha. And I'll talk about it in a little bit. Because knowing our doshas and our dosha makeup helps us to regulate our health and to take simple steps to be able to maintain our health and well-being. By understanding dosha, so he says summer dosha. So the doshas and equilibrium. The summer agni. Agni is digestion, metabolism, assimilation. So that is healthy and well-functioning. Summer datu. Datu are the body tissues in our body. You know, all our body systems. Then he says... Uh, well, mala, mala, mala is excretory functions, all well-functioning. Then he says, prasanna, atma, indriya, manaha. Prasanna means well-being. And he refers to atma, the soul, indriya, senses, and manaha, the mind. So very clear the definition is the holistic approach to medicine incorporating the spiritual aspect. So I mentioned that before. Spiritual awakening, self-realization, God-realization is the highest health in Ayurvedic medicine. Coming back to reality now, this is what we face, obesity. Right? Baby look nice and chubby. I see some of them in the office. Right? Nice and chubby. Trained that we like them fat and chubby and pinchy cheeks, but um, overweight, right? Right? Children looking at on the screen with COVID too. A lot of children at home have been on the screen. Quite a lot. Screen for school, screen for recreation, eating too much putting on weight. A lot of kids put on a lot of weight over this past year during COVID. So obesity. WHO is very clear. Almost um, one, uh, two out of six, one third of the world is overweight or obese. Two billion. We have six billion in the world. Two billion are overweight or obese. That, those are very, very worrying statistics. And it means that and childhood obesity is on the rise. In Trinidad, and Tobago, childhood obesity, maybe 30 to 35% of the population, maybe even more. I have kids in my clinic who are diabetic at 9 and 10 years of age. Okay? So that's, that's, not, that's not the right direction that should, we should be heading. So we all know obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, stroke, peripheral vascular disease. Also lifestyle diseases, including things related to alcohol. Smoking significantly increases your risk of heart disease. We know all these things. And Dr. Dial Singh, you know... Um, things related to suicide and depression. Mental health is extremely important. So what does Ayurveda have to offer to help us to maintain health from a holistic point of view? So health is our natural state. And there could be minor imbalances or major imbalances. And with minor imbalances, we can make simple adjustments to, life, to lifestyle. Diet, they said the kitchen is a pharmacy. Exercise, sleep, okay? So simple lifestyle changes can help us to maintain health. If it becomes major imbalance, then you need your therapeutics. So could we maintain health so that we don't have to reach a level where we need a whole lot of medicine to be able to uh, cure disease? So this was mentioned in the video initially. You know, Ayurveda describes six levels of pathology. In fact, one, two, and three occurs early when there's minor imbalances in the system. And four, five, and six is where me Western medicine is able to detect disease. So we learn about signs and symptoms of disease when we study in medical school. So if somebody comes in with certain symptoms, we diagnose them, okay, this is diabetes, it's a hypertension, it's a silent killer because they have no symptoms sometimes. Right? So different diseases have signs and symptoms. But um, in Western medicine, the signs and symptoms occur here at stage four. 
in Ayurveda, they describe stage is one, two, and three, which are precursors in terms of balance. So if you're able to detect imbalances early and make simple changes that can adjust the balance, you might be able to prevent the onset of disease. So that's a really, really important contribution Ayurveda has to make in terms of understanding pathology and looking at imbalance and correcting imbalance before it becomes pathology. Okay, so stage one to three can be managed with, with basic things, lifestyle, diet, exercise, and then when you reach a four to six, you need more intensive treatment. So Ayurveda clearly addresses health from the physical, mental, and the spiritual. All three are important in combination. All right, so the doshas. All right, so vata, pitta, kapha. we all made up of these three doshas. Vata, air, light, pitta, fire, kapha, earth. Those are the five elements, space, air, fire, water, earth. The vata dosha, space and air, pitta is fire and water, kapha, earth and water. Now, all of us are made up of the all three. Understanding your doshas helps you to regulate your body system. So the vata dosha relates to transportation, movement, communication, pitta to metabolism, digestion, transformation, kapha, earth, shakti, co cohesion. So now, I'll talk a little bit so everyone here can think about your doshas and try and figure out what your dosha might be, briefly. Not, not won't be too long. Um, so there are seven basic body types described in Ayurveda. The vata predominant person, pitta predominant person, kapha predominant person, and then you have combinations. Vata, pitta, pitta, vata, examples. I'll show you the picture. So the kapha is sort of the heavy, heavy set person. You know, big, strong, heavy, thick, muscular. Pitta is medium built, and vata is a thin, wiry person. Is the vata person. No, I said we all have three doshas, vata, pitta, and kapha. So understanding the combinations helps us to now take measures to maintain balance. So anybody here, okay, for example, the vata person could eat six times for the day and don't put on no weight. Kapha person eat once for the day and still gain in weight. Anybody here eating once for the day and still putting on weight? <laughs> all right. And then the vata person, I have a relative, he will eat six times for the day, and he's still skinny like a stick. So the, so the vata person actually needs to eat more because of their dosha makeup. Kapha person needs to eat less. I'll give an example. I was working in London about um, 12 years ago, and I had a really, really bad, a really, really tough job. I said, go to leave, to leave home work at 6 o'clock in the morning, get home at 6 in the evening, sometimes 9 in the night. And I just got married, so I said get heavy breakfast in the morning. I said get a nice heavy lunch, and when I come home nine o'clock at night, I had a nice heavy dinner. I was eating plenty of food. The wife was real cooking for me in those days, and I was really feeling. I started to feel sick, out of balance. Um, the work was really hard, and at the same time, I was doing this Ayurveda course in England at the time. And I made one simple change to my lifestyle. I stopped eating too much food. I started having very light breakfast. Lunch was the, best, the heaviest meal of the day, and then a, a light dinner. That simple change in diet by having light dinner, light breakfast, and a good lunch was enough to just uh, rebalance things for me. And I learned that when I was studying Ayurveda. So quite often, simple changes can help us in terms of maintaining our balance. So the vata person, slim, right? It's a cold dosha, so sometimes they tend to feel cold plenty, right? Um, dry, dryness, so like dry skin, dry hair, restless, change in mood sometimes. Learn fast, but forget fast. That is the vata person. Um, light sleeper, sometimes prone to fear and anxiety and worry. The pitta person, is fire, pitta is fire. So good digestion, medium build. Sharp intelligence, decisive personality, make good politician. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a warm dosha, so tolerate coal very well. Um, all right. Then there's the kapha person, the, the large, heavy built person. Um, kapha persons, um, it's a cold dosha, they tend to not tolerate coal well. They tend to have a sort of peaceful, loving sort of temperament. Um, all right. So those are the three types, vata, pitta, kapha. And if you go online, you can find questionnaires that will help you to work out your dosha combination. 
So vata, pitta, kapha, ikadu, akli, work out your dosha combination. Understanding a dosha combination helps you, you now to monitor yourself and to take steps that will help you. So what are the basics? Very basics. And today I'm not talking about therapeutics at all. I'm not going to talk about ashwagandha or any of the herbal products. I'm going to talk about basic stuff. Diet, exercise, sleep, mental hygiene, right? Sadhana, which is good for spiritual practice and spiritual well-being. So we, we, uh, uh, Dr. Ramnai mentioned we are 70% water. Right? There's an interesting study by a Japanese scientists who showed that water, the energy in water is vibrational. So like when you chant a mantra, for example, it energizes the water in your body. You, you are 60-70% you are water. So the things that influence us, we're actually influencing the water in our body. So if we don't exercise, I mean, what happens to a stagnant pond, right? It begins to stink. So exercise is extremely, extremely important. And it's a natural way to detox the body, natural way to build the immune system. You sleep better when you exercise, all right? Your digestion is better, okay? Vata person is light exercise, kapha heavy exercise, pitta person sort of medium level exercise. So exercise also depending on your dosha composition. If you have vata and you go and do too much exercise, you, could, you can affect your um, equilibrium. Okay, so the way you approach exercise is important based on your combination of doshas, vata, pitta, or kapha. Surya Namaskar, just mentioned briefly, excellent exercise from the yoga tradition. It incorporates movement, and um, pranayama, right, stretching, every up movement, every up, up movement you take inhalation, out, down movement you do exhalation. So it's an excellent, excellent exercise, holistic exercise. Really, really simple to do, nice to learn, good practice. Surya Namaskar. Um, diet. So, so different foods um, relate to different doshas. So for example, pepper. Pepper is pitta dosha. So if you're a pitta person and eat too much pepper, you might get an ulcer. Simple as that. So you need to monitor what you eat. If you're a kapha and you love chocolate and you love all the sweet things and you eat too much, well, you put on weight and then you're going to get diabetes. Um, chickpeas, those things create gas and it's vata aggravating, right? So understanding your kitchen as your pharmacy, understanding the foods that you take on a daily basis, and how it influences your doshas helps you to maintain your um, health and balance, right? So these are some vata increasing foods like, you know, popcorn, junk food, beans, things like that. Pitta foods, pepper, garlic, ginger. For example, in like um, Dr. Ramtine mentioned um, turmeric and coriander and one other thing. Yeah, uh, zero, zero spin. But, you know, you can make in, in Ayurveda... They describe all different types of teas that you can make. So you could, simple things in the kitchen. Cinnamon, right? Black pepper. Um, you can use turmeric, ginger. All those things you can make different teas. And it, it, the dosha composition is different in different teas. And those help too with balancing your doshas. And these are simple things. It's there in the kitchen. Um, caffeine, we, have, we know caffeine increasing foods, right? Cheese, flour, milk. Right. This is a really, really, really nice diagram that I just want to mentioned briefly, because it's really, really practical and useful information, which I learned when I was studying a bit of Ayurveda. The day cycle is governed by the doshas also. So six in the morning to 10 at night, to 10, sorry, six in the morning to 10 a.m. is a kapha time. 10 to two is a pitta time. Two to six in the evening is vata time. Again, six to 10 in the night is kapha. Um, 10 to two is pitta and Two to six in the morning is vata time. Now, when you're a teenager, you wake whole night and you get up six or eight o'clock in the morning and you eat a big meal, you're sluggish for the whole day and you'll do nothing, right? Because you're lethargic all day. Because you got up in the kapha time of the day. So, eight o'clock, sun and rise, you eat a big meal, you're sluggish for the whole day. That's a kapha time of the day. We learned that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Well, actually, that's not true. Lunch is probably the most important meal because the pitta metabolic time of the day is between 10 and 2, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So the, be the heaviest meal should actually be between 10 and 2 when the body is most active. Breakfast does not need to be heavy depending on your dosha makeup. Right? When the body is least active in the morning time, you know, when you now get up in the morning, when the body is least active, you don't need a heavy meal. Right? So the heaviest meal should actually be here. 
between 10 and 2 during the, during the day. Now, also to in the evening, you should leave two to three hours for your food to digest properly because this time of the night between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. is, is considered to be a pitta phase. And it's, a, it's a phase of rejuvenation during the night. And Dr. Ramline mentioned that night is a time for rejuvenation. So what happens is when the food is properly digested early, the body has time to rejuvenate um, during this 10 to 2 phase in the night, which is a rejuvenating phase of the night. When you eat too late, the body is actually digesting food in that pitta phase. And it shouldn't be digesting food that time of the night. It should be rejuvenating. So food should be eaten early, enough time to digest, and then you allow the body time to rejuvenate during that pitta phase of the night. Another example, like when you're a teenager and you're waking late, right, the body naturally gets sleepy by around 10 p.m. When you awake later than 10 p.m., you go into the pitta phase. So you suddenly get more energy now. And you start to get hungry. And you want to party whole night, right? So these phases of the day are really, really important and it's really practical. Um, you can think about your doshas, your dosha makeup, and start now regulating yourself based on these, um, the day cycle, which is described in Ayurveda, right? And then regulate your eating patterns based on, based on that also. Right, so I mentioned all these things already, right? Getting up early in the morning, right? Don't get up in, into the kapha phase of the morning because you'll be sluggish. Get up be, be, be between 4 to 6 a.m., which is an energy-filled time of the day. And we know this 4 to 6 a.m. In, in Ayurveda is considered the Brahma Muhurta time, which is excellent for study and meditation. So it's an excellent time of the day for your sadhana and spiritual practice. All right? Um, yes, I mentioned those things already. Avoid overeating. Avoid eating without hunger. Emotional eating. Eating when constipated. All these are basic recommendations in Ayurveda. Eat fresh fruit and vegetables. You know WHO says reduce sugar, so we know all these things. Very important idea in Ayurveda is listening to the body's intelligence. It, is, it relates to all the things I just said about your doshas, dosha makeup, the foods that you eat. Listen to your body. Your body will tell you things that agree with you and don't agree with you. Animals have this instinct. You sometimes see the dog eating grass. You, know? you, you see them doing that sometimes. So learning to tune yourself to your body and your mind also, and listening to your body's intelligence is important. That helps you to regulate your health also. And briefly, I'll just talk about mental health. So just like we digest food and assimilate food into our system, we also digest experiences through our mind. So, so things that are not digested properly from our experiences and leave what we call you know, problems in the mind, whether it's things, worries, grudges, all these things. So things that are not processed well remain in the mind and cause mental health difficulties, things like depression, anxiety, and all these things. So the assimilation through our mind is extremely important to pay attention to, not just physical health, but mental health. Okay, so briefly, mantra. Man is mind. Tra means to protect. Mantra is that which protects the mind. And there are many, many, many mantras in the Ayurvedic tradition and the Hindu tradition in Sanatana Dharma. Mahamrityunjaya mantra is an excellent mantra. It was chanted during the video that was showed in the beginning. Um, it is the Lord Shiva, the one who is awakened. His third eye is awakened. He is in the state of self-realization. It says in the mantra that you worship Lord Shiva who has three eyes, Triambakam. Sugandim Pushti Vardhanam. Today we talk about potion, nutrition. Pushti means he nourishes the universe. Vardhanam means he causes everything to grow and evolve. And here in this mantra, it also mentions Amrita. It says, free me from death, but not from Amrita, which is the goal of God realization. But chanting mantra, and they're all, all different kinds of mantras. Okay? Um, mantra itself helps to protect our mind. Helps to create the right vibrations, helps to balance the system also. I know from my own practice, when I do japa, which is chanting of your mantra, um, and all of us, some of us have, have a mantra from our guru, etc., it helps to balance and calm down the system. It does. So it, the only way you'll know is to try it. You should do it. Mantra is excellent to practice, right? Japa and mantra. Om is excellent to chant also. All right, Gayatri Mantra. We did the Gayatri Mantra initially. Okay, so Gayatri Mantra, excellent for students. Um, prayer and devotion, if you are a religious person. Moderation. 
and discrimination, meaning that right now in the world we have social media, TV. You have, I have children who come to my clinic who are on the screens 24 hours a day. I mean, the screen is on all day. And we don't have to tell parents to limit the amount of screen time that children are having. We've even seen children with developmental problems because that, that may or may not be related to too much screen time. But some of the research now is showing that too much screen time could affect children's speech development. So moderation and being selective in terms of what you allow to enter in their mind in terms of everything's available on all social media is extremely important. And then there's the problem of addiction. Okay, we have children addicted to video games. We have persons addicted to the internet. We have all different kinds of addictions. These are problems of the mind. Now, unless we take measures from early in life to pay attention to the, the, the health of our mind, we will end up having problems with mental health later in life. And having a spiritual perspective is extremely important in addressing mental health. Okay, so in summary, today I spoke about Ayurveda from a preventative healthcare point of view. There's a lot that we can do in a simple way, understanding our doshas, understanding the effect of food on our system, paying attention to diet, exercise, sleep, the daily um, rhythm. All these things will help us in maintaining health and maintaining our equilibrium. Sometimes a disease will have to come. You might still get diabetes, but these practices will help you manage with that also. Okay? So Ayurveda has a lot to offer um, from a preventative healthcare point of view. Um, in terms of the therapeutic aspects, what has to happen is the evidence base. Research has to grow because in Western medicine, we focus a lot on evidence-based practice and evidence-based medicine. So we look at research, randomized control trials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Ayurveda to fit into the Western pool has to now, and there's a whole body of research going on in Ayurveda now. So in the, in the long term, research has to develop. As research develops, it will align itself more to the Western medical fold. But to me, Ayurveda is not Western medicine. It's a whole lot more than that. And we should remember it and not just try to fit Ayurveda into Western medicine because it, it has so much more to offer. Okay, thank you so very much for your time. Adieu. Thank you, Dr. Bahadur Singh, for your very informative and enlightening presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, our final presenter for this evening is Dr. Himlata Sanghi. Dr. Sanghi is a medical doctor who was born in Hyderabad, India, and later migrated to Trinidad and Tobago in 1979. Currently, she is a spiritual head of the Brahma Kumari Centers in Trinidad and Tobago and the surrounding Caribbean region. Sister Himlata, she is fondly called, was also a recipient of the gold medal for the development of women for community service. Ladies and gentlemen, I now invite Dr. Sanghi to the stage. Om Shanti, greeting of peace and divine love each and every one of you, and happy Diwali in advance. We heard so many aspects of our Vedas, and it is such a big field of our Vedas, which help us in so many different ways. I am not a scholar of the our Vedas, but I am having the little practical experience what our mother, grandmothers, and anybody learned person in the society will tell us for small and big sicknesses if it happens, what to take, as we say that our own kitchen is our dispensary. So for if anything happened, any fever happened, we were not taken to the doctors immediately, but our mother or grandmother will go in the kitchen and make kada. You must have heard the word kada, which the little clove and the haldi and different type of things they put. And they would take us to the bed, not prepare to sleep, and then put the kada in, bring the kada and not go nowhere. 
cover ourselves and sweat and next day we feel nice you know things like that so i'm not very technical in those things as a children we used to fall so many times while playing we never put any antiseptic or anything they will put some some things they mix together and they put and everybody knows how the haldi milk is very good for all those things so like this very minimum medical um, practice or going to the doctor we grow up in the childhood first time when i went to get to doctor is when i fell down and broke my bones there is no medicine in that that sense but it enhanced the ayurvedic medicines enhance the healing so that's the time i went first time to doctor then i went to the school and everybody say what is the profession you going to have what is the profession you want to learn and i everybody say they want to become engineer they want to become doctor they want to become so i said i also become the doctor no so that's just for curiosity and the respect of the doctor profession i enter in the medical fact medical studies and i study after two or three years of studies i realized this is not a complete medicine because you are treating the patient you are testing the patients and there is no nothing is coming as a negative uh, test and yet the person is having the same symptoms and same things so i realized that there is something more than the physical medicine modern medicine and that i felt that something related to the psyche or something related to the mind that way i i felt and that is where i joined the brahma kumari institution to recognize who am i and what i can do to bring the med- medicine and meditation together in order to solve the problems of many which i feel was a felt was a very good practice to serve the humanity at that moment and now i am more inclined to the spirituality and also practice some part of it i do the fasting aspect of the ayurvedas many times i do fasting aspect of it where we don't eat the snacks in between or food cook food in between <clears throat> up to certain number of hours and that also has great effect on the body i realize that no matter how much exercise you do how much diet you do and how much fasting you do but one factor which affect and fail everything else is our stress when you have this stress the body get as acidic and happens like that last year when the corona virus started i was in mount abu and it was a cold place i did had a coughing coughing and all of a sudden this corona virus the first symptoms is coughing and i was not i did not know the seriousness of this sickness what is it is but i had to travel and all of a sudden the inspiration came to me that how am i to handle these things traveling through the different countries my travel was from the time i left the home to reach to the home of the train that was 50 hours via america because everywhere i had to spend about 12 hours 20 hours at the at the airport so i just said to me myself i'm not walking with any food and we don't eat the food from outside so i'll go the fasting so 
by the time I reach America, and I just drink water, and I rest, because there's no need to do any physical things in the plane. And by the time I reach America, my cough gone. It is fasting. And then first time I eat the food in America, because somebody from the center bought some food for us, and for me, and then I eat that time. And that helped me to develop further my routine of the day for every day since the coronavirus and even now. And I think that has helped me to maintain. And I start searching for the YouTube. And I said, no, let me eat more raw food and then the cooked food. So I eat only once in a day food, and the rest of the time, I take the raw food and no snacks in between. You may not be seeing that I'm thin and tiny as brother from Chiguana's <laughs> doctor, but I feel very healthy in some way or other way. Mentally also, I feel very strong. And most important is that people have so much fear of this virus, but somehow through the meditation, through the self-understanding, it has become easy for me not to have the fear. When I talk to somebody, I don't even, I forget everything as the person can infect me or I can infect the person at a particular time. And of course, we follow the social distance, um, mask, and cleaning ourselves. Uh, that was a, but all these things we had been doing, but we were never systematic in our life. But our Vedas and our life shows us, discipline shows us, that how we can be disciplined in some way or other way. And that disciplined life through the our Vedas and modern medicine can definitely help us. So those are the things which my immunity system work through these things. People have the different type of immunity. I used to take the Cada in the beginning when it came. But then I started feeling that this is a warm country. And because of the warm country, it did create some kind of warmth in the body. So I had to stop and start once in a while or something of that effect. So I'm very thankful to all the information which we have at this present time. I will going to give the thought on that and try to read more on those things. If you have any question, I think I can approach you all to, to clarify, especially this dark energy and light energy and neutral energy, uh, all those things I like to be interested in. But mostly we do medi meditation is our main thing, which make us stress-free and free from the desires of the world which really cause all the problems, the fear of death. All this we can overcome through the meditation. Our meditation is very simple. First is going within, who am I? And just contemplating on my own self with my original virtues and powers, which is peace, love, light and might. And the second stage is inside out, connecting ourselves with the source, the divine God, who is also the ocean of peace, love, purity, and taking that energy from him, and then radiating that energy to others in the universe, to the people, to the nature, five elements, plants, animals, whatever is living being on this earth. So it's very simple. We do this meditation. We do a lot of counseling also to the people. And that also helps many people. So I will not take much of your time, because I'm not a scholar to have that authority to speak. But just I had a little practical experiences which I share with you. So we'll do the little meditation with you before we start.
you just sit wherever you are. Just try to relax yourself. And for a few minutes, we'll concentrate fully what I will be saying and see how deep you can go within. As I said, the first stage of meditation is turning within. Let us become aware of ourselves as a spiritual energy and body as an instrument. Let us visualize this energy of the soul, the spirit, the atma, in the center of the forehead as a tiny little star is sparkling in the center of the forehead. Visualize, see, visualize in the center of the forehead just for a few seconds. And then you remind yourself of your original qualities. I am a pure energy. I am a pure energy. I am a peaceful being. Rewind a few more times. I am a peaceful energy. I am a peaceful energy. I am a peaceful energy. And feel the peace from within. Feel the peace from within. You as a soul is source of peace or image of peace. We all are image of peace. I am peace. I am peace. This is my religion. And now, remind yourself, I am a loving energy. a powerful energy which has courage, willpower, determination, and fearlessness. Stabilize yourself on the seat of self-respect of purity, peace, love, and spiritual strength. Seated on the street of the self-respect, turn your mind inside out, in this space, in the sky, in the world of silence beyond these five elements. Call Brahman, world of golden red color light. In the background of golden red color, orange color, there is a world of souls. Billions of stars shines in the midst of the billions of stars, there is one particular unique star that is God the Supreme, who is constantly sending his rays of peace, love, light, might, mercy, and bliss. Tune yourself to these rays 
visualize the rays of peace, love, light and might are coming towards me, covering me, surrounds me, creating the aura of spiritual energy. Continue to absorb this energy. Allow this energy to get in your body and heal the body and be the instrument of God and allow this energy of God, the supreme, peace, love, mercy and bliss to flow through your being through your center of the forehead, through your eyes, through your body, around you, to your closest relations, extended family, neighbors, and professional colleagues. Allow this energy to radiate all the animals flying on the earth, in the water. Allow this energy to radiate from you, coming from God to the plants and trees. Allow this energy to reach the water, fire, air, ether, and earth. And once again, remind yourself you are a child of God, the soul, protected and guided and blessed, free from the fear of uncertainty. I am a peaceful energy. Om Shanti. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanghi, for your contribution. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now move on to the cultural performances for this evening. Our next presentation is a dance performance by Ms. Dia Palakal. Ms. Palakal is currently being trained by the MJICC teacher, Mrs. Sri Ranjani Umish. Ms. Palakal's dance performance would be on Vidyanatha Ashtakam, which is a divine hymn that explains Lord Shiva's greatness as Vidyanatha or the Lord of Health. Among the several names of Lord Shiva, names like Vijayanatha and Mahakala are linked with increasing longe longevity, curing diseases, and bestowing good health. Of these, the name Vijayanatha means the Lord of Health and as a king of physicians. On Ayurveda Day, during this pandemic, we pray to the Lord of Health to bestow good health to everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ms. Palakal on stage. श्रीराम सौमित्री जटायु वेद षडानलादित्य पूजार्चिताय श्री Shambhu Mahadeva, Shambhu Mahadeva, Shambhu Mahadeva, 
Today, accompanying him on the harmonium is renowned local singer and musician, Sri Rana Mohit. Mr. Khan is a well-known tabla player in India. He initiated his childhood talim of tabla at the age of four under his uncle, Ustad Rashid Mustafa Thirakwa, and is the grandson of the legendary tabla maestro, the late Padma Bhushan Ustad Ahmed John Thirakwa Khan Sahib. Representing the fifth generation of his family, Mr. Khan has been vibrantly keeping his tradition alive by developing his own unique style of tabla playing, which comprises various karanas. Mr. Khan has performed nationwide and in several countries, and has also accompanied a number of great artists, including Ustad Amjad Ali Khan, Pandit Hari Prasad Charesya, Padmashri Pankaj Uras, and Anup Ch Jalota, among others. Namaste. A very good evening to all of you. Today I will be presenting Drut Tintal, Fast Le Tintal, which is based on 16 bit time cycle. In the beginning, I will be playing Peshkar. Then some kaidas from different different schools, gharanas. After that, I will play rela. Then I will play some gads, which is uh, uh, short pieces. So I would like to take your permission. Start. composition kaida Thank you. 
composition I'm going to play sound like a steam engine train. Beautiful Kaida, but you you will get feel of a steam engine train. over the bridge. dedicate my wife she's sitting here so there's a in tabla the bowls the sound whatever we play it have a feelings it has their own language so angry mood nice mood so you will feel whenever i come back late from the program sometimes our director mr rami ajay ji send us penal faizabad to perform so whenever i come back so whenever i sometimes i come back late so i enter my house my house so i just knock the gate so its composition is like this dekhta kata ke ke din lagde कदा के नना नदा हिंदा करते ते धधक तगड़ा धधक तगड़ा धधक तगड़ा सो द जस्ट लिसन द कन्वर्सेशन बिटवीन एंग्री वाइफ एंड द इनोसेंट हस्बैंड सो व्हेनेवर आई एंटर सो आई कम देयर सो आई नॉक द डोर सो शी ओपन द गेट धधक तगड़ा वेयर यू वेंट very innocent yes kata ke ke din i was performing in the program so nagdhet kata gintran na you didn't see the time and you didn't tell me you didn't inform me so i am sorry but now i am feeling hungry so can i get food so she said kate te ta you didn't get food there over there i said no 
So she said, Go back there and eat there only. So the composition. type of uh, sounds, this type of a bowl, he used to do uh, thunder. Question answer between you and I. Then, then, uh, are you ready? Would you like to do some couple of bowls with me? Okay. Then, na na. Then, then, na na. Then, then, na. Whatever I will say, you have to repeat it. Da da te te da da tu na. Ta ta te te da da dhi na. Good, very good. Ta ta te te da da ti na. Ta ta te te da da dhi na. Very good. Da da te te da da ti na. Ta ta te te da da dhi na. Dada tete, dada dina. Tata tete, dada dina. Dada tete, dada dina, No problem, no problem. Next, next Diwali function. <laughs> so, please come in my class, join in uh, Tabla class, then you will see, you will see, no? Easy. Then, 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 then. Very beautiful composition I am going to play now. I will com conclude my recital, my recital with this beautiful composition, which like sound, which sounds like a tasa. It's called Lal Kila. Lal Kila means red fort. So we used to celebrate in old days. We used to celebrate our uh, functions with the tasa. Here, here in Trinidad also. You know, the custom, they play tasa whenever they uh, celebrate any function. So, the, in, in, uh, on the tabla, you will listen the sound of tasa.
What a wonderful performance. Please give them another round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of our program, and I now invite Mr. N. Lingi Chetty, Second Secretary at the High Commission of India, to deliver the vote of thanks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As we come to the end of today's event, it is indeed my privilege and honor to do a vote of thanks. You have all been very patient, very patiently listening to such, such a long uh, program. Uh, but I indulge a few more minutes of uh, your patience because I have to do the honors of out of thanks. So Ayurveda Day is celebrated every year since 2016 on the day of Dhanvantri Jayanti for promotion of Ayurveda. As the, all the speakers uh, repeatedly mentioned, the Ayurveda word translates to knowledge of life. To me, as a simple person, the knowledge of life that is Ayurveda is a unique medical concept where the science meets spirituality which seeks to promote health in harmony with mind and spirit. As we today celebrate 6th Ayurveda day in Trinidad on the theme Ayurveda for portion, that is Ayurveda for nutrition for the, for the first time in uh, Mahatma Gandhi Institute for Cultural Cooperation, we are indeed fortunate to have had such a distinguished set of speakers in our midst, enlightening us with their expert knowledge on this ancient medical tradition. Firstly, I would like to thank His Excellency, Mr. Arun Kumar Sahu, High Commissioner of India, for his keynote address. In fact, he has been the guiding and driving force behind today's event. So thank you very much, sir. Our heartfelt special thanks also goes to all the distinguished set of speakers who have taken out their time out of their busy schedule and gracing this event both with their present and wonderful presentations and looking at the Ayurveda uh, and giving their dimension of uh, Ayurveda. First, the heartfelt thanks and pranams goes to Swami Brahmadevji, spiritual head of Brahma Vidya Pitam, for, the, for his words of uh, wisdom. Uh, he is being an uh, authority on the Vedic knowledge. He has been, the, I, in my opinion, he has been the right person uh, to have been here and to have uh, shared uh, his uh, wisdom on this vast uh, was tradition. Second, my thanks goes to Senator Dr. Varma Dayal Singh for his wonderful remarks uh, on Ayurveda and its benefits. I am sure that everybody enjoyed his presentation. Then to Dr. Chabinath Hari Ram Narayan of Istara Medical Limited. Thank you, doctor, for some of the very new uh, dimensions you brought into the Ayurveda. The, some of the concepts like dark energy and all, it's a revelation to me. So it, I think it will make many people interested in, uh, in this field. Then to Dr. Prithiviraj Bahadur Singh, who, is, who happens to be a pediatrician lecturer in child health, uh, health care, but also has studied Ayurveda in, in his own way for giving such an uh, informative and outstanding presentation on Ayurveda. So while thanking Dr. Bahadur Singh, we also thank uh, Swamiji of Chinmaya Mission and uh, his uh, Brahma, other uh, staff members there for proposing his name and uh, all their kind support for the event. Then to Sister Hemlata, spiritual head at Brahma Kumari's Raj Yoga Center, Thank you, sister, from, for bringing your greetings and for the small meditation you did. So, so coming to the, our own artists who added color and flavor to today's event, I extend my thanks and appreciation to 
Miss uh, Dia Palakkal. What a wonderful dance performance for her age. I'm certain that everyone enjoyed her humble but very sincere effort. Uh, I thought uh, the theme which she selected was very contextual to the event. Um, in fact, this is her first performance in Porto Spain. She's new here. I su I'm sure that she will, we will be seeing more of her performance in the days to come. Then to our own uh, Arshad Khan, that uh, tabla teacher, and uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Rana Mohib for that uh, vibrant musical performance. There was a bit of a storytelling also, so it was really interesting and enjoyable. So another, another set of special thanks goes to Shashal Jagasar uh, of our I, I Commission for wonderfully moderating this event. Uh, I'm pretty ha happy for you. I also would like to thank uh, Britain Pie Limited for display of the Himalaya Ayurvedic products, which you can see uh, right to me. Um, please have, a, a, after this program, kindly have a look at their products. Uh, and to Hare Krishna Trading Limited for their display and sampling of Girna tree, so which you will be seeing uh, right ahead of me. And try to see some of the, sample some of their uh, herbal tea. And on the technical side, I thank AJ Sound Company for the sound system, Lal Boys Video and Editing for the videography, Ballroom Sound System for the, the projection uh, you, you have been witnessing, and Chris Maharaj Tent and Event Rentals for the chairs and other this, this supply. So lastly, my heartfelt thanks to all my colleagues in the I Commission and to Director MGACC and her team for their sincere support in putting up this uh, wonderful event. Finally, to you all, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being such a lovely audience. I am certain that this program on Ayurveda was extremely beneficial and useful to you, and you will help us to propagate the awareness on benefits of Ayurveda for the universal well-being, health, and harmony. So this is Diwali week. I also wish you a very happy Diwali and happy and healthy Diwali.